Hello, good afternoon. Uh, we've got two different subjects to cover for this week. Uh, so do pay attention. It's double the work this week. This is the only week I think that I'm doing that. And I apologize. It's just kind of the way the calendar sits. So we're looking at the PowerPoint on China and Japan. And then we're looking at the PowerPoint for Russia as well. Now let's get started with this. First topic up is going to be China. Now, when we look at China in the year 1800, it looks like a really strong civilization, but in reality, China is in the middle of a crisis. Uh, one thing that happens is between 1750 and 1850, the population of China has increased from about 180 million all the way up to 430 million. Now, this is going to cause famine simply because there's not enough food for everybody. Uh, food prices are going to soar. Peasants move around hoping to find food. Land owners are forced to sell land for prices far below their value. Chinese peasants are driven deeper into poverty while the land owners, uh, the rich merchants, and the public officials are growing even richer. And young men and women in villages, they begin to plot against the government with aims to overthrow the emperor. This is also at the same time that Britain is in the process of building a global empire and China is in its target. And that's really gonna come into fruition with the opium trade. Uh, the opium trade is gonna be Britain's entryway into China. And long story short, British merchants are importing large amounts of tea, porcelain, and silk from China, but there's very little that the Chinese want from Britain. So this meant that Britain was forced to pay for Chinese goods in silver bars. And to balance the cost of imports, Britain turns to opium, which it produced in surplus in India. Britain's basically going to get the Chinese people in the city of Canton hooked on drugs. Now the British begin to smuggle large quantities of opium into Canton and by 1830, eight out of every 10 people living in the city are addicted. Uh, many people make huge profits off the sale of opium, and the Chinese government becomes horrified over both the profits being made by Britain and the addiction issues. Uh, and the silver that Britain used to pay China is now being turned around, and China is paying silver for British drugs. This is going to lead to the Opium Wars. Uh, China is going to declare opium illegal in 1839 and a guy named Lin Se Sui is going to represent the Chinese government and is going to order all the Chinese and foreign merchants to surrender all the opium cargo to the Chinese government. Now the British are going to agree to this but instead of handing the opium to Chinese officials like they're supposed to, they instead give it to the British Navy. By giving the opium to the British Navy, that made the opium property of the British government. Well, Chinese officials are going to board the British naval ships, they're going to seize the drugs, and then the British government is going to claim that this was an act of war, and they declare war on China in September of 1839. Now the war goes really, really badly. China definitely loses. And by August of 1842, the war has ended and the Treaty of Nanking is signed. And China agrees to abolish the Canton system. So no more British trade only in the city of Canton. In fact, five port cities are open for trade. There's the city of Canton, Amoy, Fuchao, Ningpo, and Shanghai. All five of those cities are open to British merchants, British government officials, British families. China's ordered to pay $21 million to Britain to pay for all the opium that was destroyed. Also, Hong Kong is given to Great Britain and Great Britain keeps Hong Kong until 1997. Another big part of this treaty is Great Britain is given anything that China gives to another country. So if China gave the country of France a puppy dog, Great Britain got a puppy dog too. 
and last but not least, British subjects are not to be tried or gone, go through the Chinese judicial system. All British subjects are to be tried in British courts no matter what. This is going to devolve into something called spheres of influence. Britain is not satisfied with its victory over China and they want more so they team up with France to get more. The French are going to go on to claim that one of their missionaries is tortured and executed and the British and French are going to use this to declare war on China in 1856. This second opium war lasts four years and it ends with the same results as the last one. Now this time the Chinese government is forced to allow Christian missionaries to operate in the country and China has to pay reparations for the cost of the war. Uh, Britain also carves out a portion of China where only it was allowed to do business and then other countries are going to do the same. So Russia gets parts of Manchuria, which is the orange colored near the, the north part of the country. Japan gets the parts just north of Korea. Britain gets the Yangtze River Valley. They get Shanghai and they get Tibet as well. France gets the southern part near the Vietnamese border. So all the stuff that's in green becomes French. Then finally, Germany gets the part near Beijing. They get that little bit of bluish color that's along the coast. Now each of those countries can do business only in that section. So they're like exclusive economic zones. No other country can do business with China in a portion of China controlled by another country. This will eventually lead to the Taiping Rebellion, the Taiping Tian Kuo, or the Kingdom of Heavenly Peace as it's known in English, was founded in the year 1850. And it was founded by a peasant named Hung Sui Xuan. Now, Hung studied for the civil service exam. He read Christian writings, and he had a vision that he was the heavenly younger brother of Jesus. And it was his job to destroy the Manchu dynasty. Now, the followers of Taiping Rebellion, they're gonna cut off their big tails. They're going to demand an end to private ownership and they're going to urge equal rights for women and an end to foot binding. Now the equal rights for women was gonna be done through the ability to take the civil service exam, the ability to work in the government and the army, and then of course the ending of the foot binding. And the foot binding would be punishable by death. They also wanted to outlaw liquor, opium, and tobacco, and use of those three things would be punishable by death as well. And then last but not least, they wanted to outlaw the idea of ancestor worship too. Uh, overall, the Taiping Rebellion does not go so well. Uh, they made merchants afraid that they'd lose their status. They made the wealthy afraid that they'd lose their land. They lost peasant support because their way of life would change. And they never got foreign support because the Manchu government was willing to give stuff to the foreign governments. Uh, the fighting ends up lasting 14 years. The rebellion is defeated and somewhere around 20 million Chinese citizens die. Now the overall legacy is that it's seen as a turning point in Chinese history. It's the first time that the Manchu dynasty had been challenged it's left weakened, it never regains its strength. And many of the ideas of the Taiping Rebellion are going to survive. Now the rebellion does lead to the government trying to modernize and reform. Uh, the government wanted to keep traditions while accepting some Western style ideas. So the government sets up a foreign affairs office, they try to reform the tax system, they build modern shipyards, modern railroads, and they bring in Western science and math textbooks. They also send many students to Europe to study. 
Now this is all going to lead up to what's known as the 100 Days Reform in the year 1898. And there are many suggestions sent to the emperor, including the creation of a parliament, the adoption of a constitution, uh, the adoption of the separation of powers, a reorganization of the civil service and a reorganization of the legal code, a promotion of industry and commerce and agriculture, along with the publishing of an annual budget. Then they want to create modern elementary schools and secondary schools using the French model. They want to create the University of Beijing and they want to cremate land or dead to give more land to agriculture. Now the emperor at the time, in 1898, uh, Quang Su, he agrees to all of it. Um, unfortunately though, the reforms only last from June 11th to September 21st. His aunt overthrows him and the 100 days reform lasts only 100 days. And that's an ant up in the top right corner. This will lead to the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, the overthrow of Kuang Su and the failure to reform really makes the people angry. And another secret society is created. This secret society is known as the Righteous and Harmonious Fists or the boxers for short. Uh, the boxers, they're anti-Western, they're anti-Christian, they're very violent. And in the year 1900, they kill 242 foreign officials, they kill thousands of Chinese Christians, and the boxers are also going to burn hundreds of buildings. To stop this rebellion, a multinational army of over 20,000 soldiers is going to invade China. The Empress flees the capital dressed like a peasant. And soldiers from Germany, the United States, Great Britain, Russia, France, and even Japan are going to be involved in this fighting. Just like the rebellion before, the Boxer Rebellion does end in defeat. But out of the rebellion, a man named Sun Yat-sen is able to gather another group of revolutionaries to, to challenge the government and to change China. Now Sun Yat-sen, he gains support from the Japanese government who gives him money. He also receives support and money from Chinese citizens living in Hawaii, the mainland United States, and Southeast Asia. And Sun Yat-sen, he's creating what he called the three principles of the people. The first was nationalism, and it involved the overthrow of all dynasties and the creation of a republic led by Chinese for the Chinese. His second principle was democracy. Now this was more about individual freedoms than it was a national government. And the third of his three principles of the people was agrarianism or statism. Uh, this was the fair distribution of land by purchasing it from landlords and then returning it to the peasants. So through this agrarianism or statism program, the land would be redistributed, but a fair price would be paid to all the landlords. Now the ideas of Sun Yat-sen, they come to fruition with the Nationalist Revolution on October 10th, 1911. The Manchu dynasty is overthrown, and that ends over 4,000 years of dynastic rule. The Nationalist Revolution, it works until 1949, and then yet another revolution happens, and China becomes a communist government. Now let's also look at Japan for a moment. Japan had been isolated for hundreds of years. The Tokugawa shogunate had expelled nearly all Europeans from the country, and the Japanese, um, their lives pretty much maintained a similar style to 1630. Now, it doesn't mean that the Japanese were completely shut off. If you remember, the Dutch were still allowed to do business in the port city of Nagasaki, and the Japanese kept up with world news through the Dutch, so they knew what was going on in China. Now, the opening of Japan is going to occur 
when U.S. President Millard Fillmore orders the Navy to sail to Japan. And the man who's in charge is Commodore Matthew Perry. Now, Commodore Matthew Perry and his squadron, they sail into Tokyo Bay on July 8, 1853. He presented the Shogun with a message of friendship from the president, as well as a letter asking for fair treatment of shipwrecked sailors and the establishment of a refueling station. In other words, can we put a gas station here on your property? Now, Perry told the Shogun that he would return in one year for his answer. Perry left Japan and returned in 1854. And when he returned, the U.S. and Japan signed the Treaty of Kanagawa. Now, this treaty is very unfair, and some of it might found, sound familiar. Uh, U.S. citizens would be protected by the U.S. Army and by U.S. laws. Tariffs made it easy for the U.S. to sell goods to Japan, but almost impossible for Japan to sell stuff back to the United States. And within two years of the Treaty of Kanagawa, uh, I think it's 15 other nations had similar treaties with Japan. Now there's a real debate on what to do. Some daimyo clans, they said that they could defeat the Western powers while others stated that change had to happen. And there were still even some who claimed that Japan could somehow blend the traditional culture with the Western culture. The ultimate result of this is going to be the Meiji Restoration. In 1866, the Choju and Satsuma clans agreed to restore the emperor to political power instead of just being the spiritual leader of Japan. And in 1877, the Choshu and the Satsuma clans, they seize control of the imperial court and they overthrow the shogun. The city of Edo is going to be renamed Tokyo and the 15-year-old Emperor Mutsuhito becomes the political leader of the country. Now, Mutsuhito's rule goes from 1868 to 1912 and that becomes known as the Meiji Restorations. And there you have a picture of Emperor Mutsuhito right there. Now, once Emperor Meiji is restored, he is going to appoint leaders of the Chozu and Satsuma clan to be his advisors. And the leaders of the Choshu and the Satsuma clan, they both saw little chance to defeat the Western armies, and they really saw modernization and reform as the only way to go forward. So the Japanese end up being very eager to learn the secrets of Western industrialization, and they did not hesitate to import Western advisors to help them write new laws, update their economy, and develop industries. In April of 1868, a law called the Charter Oath is going to be passed, and it abolished class lines. It opened up all occupations that commoners. It called for a public assembly. The Charter Oath officially abolished feudalism and it gave the samurai five years to discard their two swords. Now, a greater blow to their pride came when the Meiji government issued Japan's first draft law, and that required all men, regardless of their social origins, to serve three years of active duty and then four years of reserve duty. To peasants, though, um, because they're working in the field for many, many hours a day, military life actually seemed easier to them than farming, and so in many cases, these peasants start to sign up for the army. Now, the Meiji government is going to send Japanese students to universities in Europe and the United States. And when they come back from Europe and the United States, they bring back with them the ideas of modern banking, modern methods of communication, modern armed forces, constitution. Um, the government also is going to end up modernizing the economy by using the modern banking system. Uh, and the 
the um, Japanese yen, their, their um, currency, is going to be introduced and set at about half the value of a United States dollar. Pretty soon there's going to be a system of compulsory education. All men, women, and children are required to learn to read, required to write, and attend school. Eventually we get to the Constitution of 1889. Uh, the Japanese are going to decide to create a government based on the German Empire. The new constitution, it retains the emperor as the hereditary head of state. It retains the emperor as the highest source of power in the country. Uh, directly below the emperor were his advisors who were the leaders of the Choshu and Satsuma clans. A parliament is going to be created known as the Diet and the Diet would be allowed to make laws and advise the Emperor on government policy. The Diet had two houses, the upper house of nobles and then the lower house of commoners. The right to vote was expanded. You had to be 25 years old or more and you had to pay at least 15 yen in taxes each year. The Constitution is going to give people some civil rights, including freedom of speech, religion, freedom of association, and the freedom from search and seizure. Now there's this clause, there's this asterisk that says, except in cases provided in law. And the government will use that clause quite a bit. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more probably about imperialism uh, when I talk about the period leading up to World War I. But it's important to know that by 1890, 50 million people lived on Japan's four main islands. It's a lot of people. I just want you to think about that. 50 million people in 1890 living in the Japanese islands huge food supply issues, famine, malnourishment. On top of that, there's a lack of raw materials. Japan gets so busy and crowded that the government of Japan is going to encourage and ask people to move to other places. And today you have a fairly large Japanese population in parts of the United States, as well as in Oh, what's the country I'm trying to think of? Um, Brazil, of all places. Now, Japan cannot send off enough people, so it's eventually going to decide to take foreign territory to try and fix its overcrowding problems. And we get two wars out of this. We get the Sino-Japanese War in 1894. That's a war with China. They're both fighting over Korea, Japan wins, and Korea becomes a colony of Japan. Then in 1904, going into 1905, we've got the Russo-Japanese War. In 1904, the, the Russians had just completed the Trans-Siberian Railroad. It ended at the city of Vlad uh, Vladivostok. And the Russians also built a naval base at Port Arthur. And Japan knew that Russia's immediate interest in Manchuria, the portion of China just north of the Korean Peninsula, uh, Russia wanted that for a warm water port. Now, Japan was willing to give that to Russia, but Japan wanted some money paid back. Russia refused to pay Japan, and they go to war. The Japanese Navy is going to attack and destroy the entire Russian Navy. All their battleships are sank. All their cruisers are sank. Uh, there's a bloody battle at the city of Port Arthur. Over 20,000 Japanese soldiers lie dead. It's very, very gruesome. On May 10th, 1905, a 
very large naval battle happens between uh, Japan and Russia. And the, Jap the Japanese Navy, they destroy 40 out of 42. That's 40 out of 42 Russian ships. Russia loses 12,000 sailors and another 6,000 on top of that are taken as prisoner. By 1910, Japan has proved that it is a Western style power. By 1910, it has proven that it is advanced enough to hang with anybody in Washington or anybody in Europe. And before you know it, Japan is going to be viewed as an equal by the United States, by Great Britain, by France, by pretty much anybody who is a Western style world power accepts Japan into their club. Now, as I switch over to the part of the lecture on Russia, here's a real quick chance to get some extra points on, we'll say, I'll add five points to your midterm exam if you answer this question. Between now and next Monday, and next Monday would be the 1st of November. Between now and Monday, the 1st of November at 11.59 p.m., send me an email telling me what museum you're going to go to or what museum you've already been to. And I will add five extra points to your midterm exam for doing that. Very simple way to raise your grade for the, uh, for the midterm. All right, 19th century Russia. And this really is a poorly named lecture on my part because I'm really talking about Russia as a whole. In fact, early Russian history, I'm looking way back at the 6th and 7th century, uh, Viking traders entered the area around present day Kiev and they established a trade route that went all the way to Constantinople. And they found that there were the loosely organized Slavic tribes that were based around timber, caviar, fish, furs, and amber. One Slavic merchant by the name of Rurik, um, he establishes a kingdom based around Kiev in or around 855. And descendants of Rurik are going to rule this kingdom all the way until 1598. Now, much of the way of life of these early Russians it's going to be taken from the Byzantines, like their laws, their government, their titles. Uh, they're all borrowed from the Byzantine Empire. Um, Saint Cyril and Saint Methodius, uh, two members of the Greek Orthodox Church, are going to make a pilgrimage to the Kievan Rus to Christianize the population. Uh, Saint Cyril develops the Cyrillic language, which is based on the Greek alphabet. And that was simply so the liturgy of the church could be written and recorded for the Kievan Rus. In the year 989, Prince Vladimir I converts to Christianity and he orders all the, the Rus to do it. And all's going great except uh, the Kievan Rus, they did not have a law that allowed the firstborn to automatically succeed. And that meant that many princes set up their own government and it was very cutthroat to inherit the, um, the leadership. To add to that, the Mongols are going to invade in 1236. So we already have a very weak government. It's fractured even more because the government, the royal family can't operate together and the Russian aristocracy, they cannot mount a defense. So Russia is going to be cut off from the West for the next 200 years as the Mongols take over. And this means that the Renaissance, it basically misses Russia completely. Uh, the Mongols are going to further encourage political fragmentation and Russia fails to develop a nationalistic movement too. 
Now, resistance to the Mongols is going to develop further north in the forests of the Volga River. And the prince of the region was named Ivan Kalitsa, and he's a chief tax collector for the Mongols in the region. Uh, now, he kept a portion of the tax money for himself, and his power grew, and eventually his city, Moscow, will dominate the northern region. Now, in 1480, Grand Duke Ivan III, also known as Ivan the Great, he's going to refuse to send tax money to the Mongols. The Mongols will send an army, and he'll defeat the Mongol army uh, sent to take Moscow and establish Moscow as the capital of a new Russian state. One of the leaders of this Russian state is going to be this guy, Ivan the Terrible. Now, he was the Grand Prince of Moscow from 1533 to 1547, and then he became the Tsar of Russia from 1547 to 1584. Uh, this guy was basically crazy. He executed all of his rivals. He ruled with an iron fist. He crushed rebellions for fun. He had a personal secret police force. And he was increasingly violent and tyrannical the older he got. He murdered some of his sons, he married seven times, and whenever he was tired of his wife, he would kill her and then marry another person. He conquered several Mongol kingdoms or Khanates, including Siberia and Ostrakhan. He attempted to conquer lands along the Baltic Sea, but he failed. Uh, he created a second class of military aristocracy to weaken the, the nobles. And then he passed a series of laws binding freed peasants to their land as serfs. Now, serfdom had disappeared from Western Europe for the most part, but it's a brand new and permanent part of life in Russia into the late 1800s. Ivan's going to die, and after his death, we come to what's known as the Time of Troubles. Uh, this is going to be a period between 1584 and 1613 with a lot of civil war and a lot of people pretending to be Ivan's dead son, Dmitri. One person who pretended to be Dmitri was actually put into a cannon and then fired out of the country in the direction of Poland. Now, Ivan was temporarily succeeded by his weak and incompetent son, Fyodor I. Fyodor dies and an assembly of boyars, which was the name of the Russian nobility, they're going to elect a guy named Boris Goodenough to the throne, but Boris dies in 1605. Open civil war breaks out and there's not a single boyar family who can gain control of the throne. Uh, by 1613, all the different sides, they're tired of fighting and the boyars elect the 17 year old nephew of Ivan, a guy named Michael Romanov as the new czar. Now, Michael Romanov and his dynasty will rule all the way until 1917. Another important guy is Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great, he rules Russia from 1682 until 1725. And he's one of the major architects of the Russian absolutist state. He also is in some ways an enlightened despot, even before enlightened despotism was a thing. Now, Peter the Great, he came to the throne as a child. He overthrew his sister, Sophia, and he decided to reform the government. So he divided Russia into 12 different provinces by 1720. Each province was further subdivided into districts. And before you know it, Russia has its first provincial government in history. In 1722, he created the table of rank. All aristocrats who owned land and serfs had to serve the state either in the military or civil administration. Uh, your promotion, your rising up the ranks was based on your ability, not just who you were born as. And no more than one half of noble men could be in service to the government at any given time. So there's a waiting period to join. He set up a governing senate. There were nine members of this governing senate. It's really more like the U.S. Capitol, or cabinet, I should say, in that they advised Peter the Great what to do. They couldn't make law themselves or anything like that. 
And then he expanded the secret police and he set up the system of internal passports that is still used today. As far as military reforms go, uh, before Peter, the czars of Russia had fairly small standing armies and Peter decided to change that. So Peter started a peasant draft where peasants between the ages of 20 and 25 were originally forced to serve for life, but eventually that was changed to 25 years. And the ratio of how many people were drafted was determined by how many men lived in a particular community. So in 1700, the army had 40,000 people. By 1725, the army had 200,000 people. He created a modern navy, at least modern for 1700. Entire forests were saved for shipbuilding. And by 1725, Russia had over 800 ships and over 28,000 sailors. Problem is, five years later, only 15 of those 800 ships were still worthy of sailing. Last but not least, uh, militarily, Peter invaded the Ottoman Empire. He invaded Sweden. He was trying to get warm water ports for each. And when he beat Sweden, he gets parts of Estonia, Livonia, and Finland. And then he built the city of Petersburg in his new territory. He faced all the government buildings west, and he modeled it off the Palace of Versailles, located in France. Economically, uh, military expenses took something like 80% of all government spending. Um, there was a mail tax that was put into place. Basically, the total expected military expenses were divided by the total number of males, and that's how much tax money had to be uh, generated that year. So to meet that huge spending level, Peter the Great is going to tax things like beards, graves, windows. He sets up state-owned industry. Uh, he sets up the system of mercantilism with high tariffs that encourage Russians to buy Russian goods. Uh, he also is going to order rich merchants to settle in St. Petersburg. And that certain items like hides and caviar and tar could only be shipped from Petersburg to other places. One side note, he never took a foreign loan and he kept his currency stabilized and unified while doing so. Religion, he's going to make the Russian Orthodox Church part of the Russian government. The patriarch, the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church died in the year 1700 and Peter the Great is going to appoint a priest to do basically whatever Peter the Great wants. And the church will eventually become an actual branch of the government from about 1721 until 1917. Now, culturally, there are some reforms there as well. Uh, for example, Peter encouraged the printing of books and literature, but the presses belong to the state. Books in science, technology, and Western history, and even law were translated into Russian. And the first newspapers are set up in 1703, but they can print whatever the government says is okay. Peter encouraged the immigration of foreign workers, especially from Germany and Holland or the Netherlands. And Peter the Great is responsible for setting up the first public theaters, public museums, and public hospitals in Russia. I also want to mention education. There was absolutely no education for non-nobles. Uh, if you were of noble descent, you could go to military academies, uh, you could go to church-run academies, but if you were not a noble, you couldn't be educated. And that's simply because he thought educated people would mean revolt. Now, secession after Peter, it's not clean. Peter killed his only son. And after Peter killed his only son and after Peter died, there was 30 years of fighting. Many of Peter's reforms were forgotten. But even so, Russia would be considered a great European power by then. So going into the 1740s, Russia had a backwards economy, but it had a good trading system. It had a strong czar, strong central government. 
the aristocracy is in line doing what they're supposed to do and the peasants are under control. Now this time um, we get Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great, she was born in Prussia, so she was an ethnic German, but she married Peter III in 1762. And to prove how Russian she was, she joined the Russian Orthodox Church, she learned the Russian language, and she did everything that a Russian was supposed to do. Uh, she was very proud of her active correspondence with the great Enlightenment thinkers, and Diderot and Jean-Jacques Rousseau actually lived in her palace. Now, very shortly after Catherine and Peter marry, Peter III is overthrown and then killed in a, quote, accident. And most people now think that Catherine had an active role in this coup to overthrow her husband. Peter was arrested and then strangled by his guards, and then nearly the moment that happened before Peter's body was even cold, Catherine took power. Now Catherine, she had many rebellions during her time. Um, she tried to expand the territory of Russia. She expanded the empire. Uh, Russia began to colonize Alaska. But Russia's economy is mainly based on serfs. And because Russia's economy is based on serfs, there's a series of rebellions, including the largest peasant revolt in Russia's history underneath Catherine the Great. Catherine is going to give more rights and privileges to the boyers. She is going to increase access to education, but once again, that's only for the upper classes. Now, one thing about Catherine I want to mention, and it's not on this PowerPoint, is Catherine was involved in many love affairs with many men. Um, after Catherine grew tired of a lover, she promoted him to some sort of high position in Russian society, got him away from her, and then moved on to the next one. And she would give gifts of land and serfs away to her former lovers. In fact, she was known to give away 100,000 serfs in a single day. One other rumor about Catherine is that she died on the toilet of a stroke. Now that's not completely false. She did collapse in the toilet. She did have a stroke while using the toilet, but she died a couple days later on her bed. All right, that's about 45 minutes of lecture. That's longer than I normally do. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, remember for this week, it's not just one, but two sets of material you need to do. So for this week, as you see there, uh, chapter 24, chapter 25, so you have the discussion questions for both chapters and the quizzes for both chapters due by Monday night, the 1st of November at 11.59 p.m. One other thing I would like to show you, I'm going to the SLO Dropbox. I have put in here today a PowerPoint with some SLO pointers to help you get ready for that. And I'm going to try to find some time this week to put together a special lecture video for you to help you get your SLO started. But it's not gonna to be today, 45 minutes, it's probably about your breaking point. So as always, any questions, concerns, comments, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to answer you. We'll talk to you soon, bye.